Hi, welcome back. In this session, I'd like to talk about summary statistics that we use to provide a picture of data in parsimonious ways. Now, let's face it, no matter how number savvy you are, if I gave you a hundred numbers, it is difficult to make sense of those numbers. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to take those hundred numbers and present statistics that capture what those numbers look like, at least across the sample. Broadly speaking, there are four groups of descriptive statistics that you will run into. The first are measures of centrality. They try to capture what the typical value is across the sample for an observation. The second are measure, measures of dispersion that tell you how much variance or spread there is of the actual data around your central value. The third is measure of symmetry, which tell you something about the skew in the data. Is data more likely to be higher than your central value or lower than your central value? And finally, of measures of extremes. How common is it for a sample observation to be very different from your central value? Measures of centrality, measures of dispersion, measures of symmetry, and measures of extremes. Let's start with measures of centrality. If you have 100 numbers in front of you, the number we most typically get drawn to is the average. What's the average? I take all 100 observations, I add them up, I divide by 100, I have the average. So for instance, if I gave you 100 years of stock returns, the average would be computed by taking all 100 years, adding them up, and dividing by 100. It's a simple average. In a twist on the simple average, you could have a weighted average. A weighted average, you weight some ob observations more than others. Maybe you could weight more recent years, more than years that are 50 or 60 or 70 years in the past. But those are averages. Now, if your distribution is symmetric, in other words, the upside and the downside look very similar, the average is sufficient. But when you have asymmetric distributions, Another value, measure of centrality you might like is the median. What is the median? The median is the 50th percentile of your data. It's exactly halfway through your data. And to get to the median, here's what I would do. If I have 101 observations, I'm going to rank them from highest to lowest. Then I'm going to count down to the 51st observation. The 51st observation is my median. Why? Because there are 50 numbers higher than it and 50 numbers lower. You got the average, you got the median. There's a third measure of centrality which you might not run into as frequently. And this is especially a number you will run into if you have um, this, you know, data that is discrete and cannot take continuous values. You might want to look for the value that you see most frequently across 101 observations. So for instance, if I have 101 people whose height I've measured, if 21 of them have a height of 5 feet 9 inches, and that is the height around which the most people are, I'm going to call that the mode. It's a number that I run into most frequently. So you've got the average, you've got the median, you've got the mode. Now when you think about these central tendency measures, let's face it, the average always matters. In fact, it is necessary for computing a lot of other follow-up measures, like the standard deviation. But the average can be misleading if you have an asymmetric distribution. Now, we haven't talked about symmetry yet, but if you, all your outliers tend to be big positive numbers, even if they don't happen very often, your average is going to get skewed towards the higher value. So when you have asymmetric distributions, the median might be a more meaningful estimate of what a typical value is in your distribution. In finance and investing, we tend to use mode less because it's designed for discrete or categorical data, which might run into the other social sciences, but less so in finance. In fact, if you see a mode, it's usually because we've taken continuous data, like debt ratios, put them into, into little buckets, let's say debt ratio between 10 and 20, 20 and 30, and say the mode, the most typical debt ratio, the, comp the debt ratio where companies most frequently fall is between 30 and 40%. But the average and the median, the numbers you're more likely to run into. So the measures of centrality. Now following from the measures of centrality are measures of dispersion. Again, broadly put, with measures of dispersion, you're looking for how much 
the values of observations vary from your central value. So let's take an extreme case. You have 101 observations, all of which take the same value. There is no dispersion. Every number is the same. The more numbers vary from your central value, the greater the dispersion. How do we measure that? The most simplistic measure of dispersion is the range. What do you do in the range? You look at the highest value and the lowest value and take the difference. And the bigger that difference, the more dispersion there is. Now, variant of the, of the standard range is what's called an interquartile range, where you take the first quartile, the 25th percent of your data, and the 75th percent of your data, and you look at the difference. So in the example that I talked about just a few minutes ago of 101 years of stock returns, I rank them in order and I look at the 25th and the 75th observation and I take the difference between those two. It's a range still, but it's a range between the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile. The problem with the range is that you often throw away a lot of data. A, a more sophisticated, if you can call it that, measure of dispersion or a more complete, let's take the sophisticated out, a more complete measure of dispersion is called the standard deviation of variance. What you look for there is the difference between each observation in the central value, and usually the average, and you square that difference because otherwise the differences will average out, and you look at the sum of the squared differences. From that you derive the variance and the standard deviation, it's a measure of dispersion. Now, when we talk about standard deviation variance, one of the points we will make is it'll take on the units of whatever your observations are denominated in. Put simply, if I measure your weight in pounds and I look at the standard deviation, the standard deviation will be in pounds. If I measure your weight in kilograms and take the standard deviation, the standard deviation will be in kilograms. You're saying, so what? If I just compare those two numbers, I'm going to find that the standard deviation in any kilogram sample is likely to be smaller than in a pound sample. And it's not because of the sample itself, but because of the way I've measured the data is different. So you think, how do I make the comparisons? There's a third measure of dispersion called coefficient of variation. What I do here is I take the standard deviation and divide it by the average. So if I have the standard deviation in pounds, I divide by the average in pounds. I come up with a scale measure of dispersion that has no units attached to it. And I can compare that scale measure across pounds and kilograms, Fahrenheit and Celsius. So you've got range, you've got standard deviation, you've got coefficient of variation. Now if you take a look at the range, as I said, it's very simple. You take the maximum value, the minimum value, and you take the difference. In fact, if you want to standardize it, you can divide it by the average of the maximum and the minimum. But if you have 101 observations, think of what you're doing. You're taking the highest and the lowest, and you're throwing out the other 99 observations. I think a more useful way, if you want to stay with simplistic, with simplistic measures of dispersion, a more useful thing to do, rather than give me just the maximum and the minimum, is to give me each decile. Basically, take the 100 observations, if you have 100, and look at the, ten, uh, the 10th percentile, the 20th, the first decile, the second decile, the third decile. I find breaking data down into deciles gives away a great deal of information about what that data looks like. So that's a range. Let's move on to the standard deviation. As I said a few minutes ago, the standard deviation is the sum of the squared differences between each observation and your average. You add up those sum, sum of the squared differences and you divide by the number of observations you have. You have the variance. Now, if this is a sample, which is what we often deal with, we divide by n minus 1, the sample size minus 1. You're saying, why minus 1? Here's the way I, re I remember why I subtract out 1. Remember that to get this, the variance, I need an average. In other words, I use an estimate to get another estimate. Because I've used an estimate that came from the sample, I lost one degree of freedom. So the variance is the sum of the square differences divided by n, if it's a population, or n minus 1. What's the standard deviation? It's the square root of the variance. You're saying, why bother? Well, you're right. If I rank companies or investments or samples based on variance, then I rank them again based on standard deviation, I'm going to get the same ranking. 
But the standard deviation is in many ways more useful than variance because of things we can do with standard deviation that we cannot do with variance. So basically, the standard deviation will be higher if there's more divergence from the mean. But as I said, it'll always be in the same units as your data. So in the context of investing in finance, let's look at two examples. If I took Apple stock prices every month for the last 60 months and I computed a standard deviation, I'm going to get a standard deviation in dollars because prices are in dollars and the number is going to be pretty high. You know why? Because Apple stock trades at $500, $600, $700 per share. If I take Apple stock prices and convert them into percentage returns, change in price from month to month, and I look at the standard deviation of those returns, those standard deviations will be in percent. So something to keep in mind. You tell me what units, your observations, are your standard deviation will be in the same units. Now, if I have to compare the standard deviations and returns across two stocks, I'm not concerned because they're both in percentage, I can compare directly. But if I have to compare the standard deviation in stock prices, which are in dollars, between a stock like Apple, which is highly priced, and a, a, a much smaller company, which has a lower stock price, I've got to be careful because if I just compare the standard deviations in dollars, Apple's standard deviation will always, always be higher because the dollar price is higher. That's where the coefficient of variation comes in. By dividing the standard deviation by the average value, I get rid of the units. I can then compare standard deviations and prices divided by the average price across companies, even if the price levels are very different. Now, if you can understand and deal with standard deviations, there is a related measure of dispersion called the standard error. Now, remember, the standard deviation measures how much variability dispersion there is in individual data values in your sample from the mean. The standard error measures how far the sample mean is from the population mean. Let's step back. The reason we look at samples is to make judgments about populations, right? So if I look at 101 years of stock returns and I compute an average, it's not because I'm interested in the average return over the next last 101 years. I'm hoping to use it to talk about what does a typical year look like for stocks? What would the returns in the population be? And that's where the standard error helps you. If you take the standard deviation and divide it by the square root of the number of observations in your sample, in this case, if I have 100 years, I divide by the square root of 100, I get a standard error. How is the standard error useful? It allows me to then make judgments or predictions about the true population mean using the average that I got from the population and the standard error. So for instance, if I got an average return of 10% a year over the 100 years, and my standard error is 2%, Remember, the central limit theorem allows you to then make the judgment that your, that your sample mean is normally distributed. 10% is my sample mean, 2% is my standard error. With 67% confidence, I can tell you that the, the return in a typical year in the stock market for the population is between 8 and 12%. That's 10% plus 2%, 10% minus 2%. If I want 95% confidence, more confidence, I make it two standard errors. That'll be 6% to 14%. If I want 99% confidence, that's three standard errors. So while the standard deviation just measures the dispersion of values around the average, the standard error allows you to take the average you get from a sample and make statements about the population and come up with ranges for your forecast. So those are measures of dispersion. Let's move to measures of asymmetry. If you have a symmetric distribution, your numbers on one side of the average look very much like the numbers on the other side of the average. Using stock returns again as my example, if I have an average stock return of 10% over the last 100 years, and I look at years where I did better than 10% and years where I did worse than 10%, if the data is symmetric, my upside and my downside look very similar. Now, if you've heard the word symmetric in a statistics class, it's usually in the context of a distribution that we run into all the time in statistics. It's a normal distribution. A normal distribution is a classic symmetric distribution. So what's an asymmetric distribution? 
Put simply, your deviations on one side of the mean are much more pronounced than deviations on the other. That deviation is usually measured with something called skewness. When you have a distribution that's positively skewed, your deviations are more pronounced in terms of observations having values higher than the average. If your distribution is negatively skewed, you have observations where you have more, ex more pronounced observations where the values are lower than the average. You think, why should I care? When you have an asymmetric distribution, as I mentioned earlier, your average becomes a little misleading. In fact, if you have a positively skewed distribution where your outliers are more likely to be on the upside, more positively skewed, your average is going to get pulled out by those outliers. The average can be deceptively high. If you have a negatively skewed distribution, your average can be deceptively low. We'll, we'll, do, we'll look at examples in the next session to illustrate this process. That's what symmetry measures. Now, in a related uh, concept, we have to think about the fact that data can sometimes be bounded. What does that mean? If you think about a typical normal distribution, you know what the range is for a value? It has to be from minus infinity to plus infinity. In the real world, and especially in finance and investing, it's difficult to find variables that go from minus infinity to plus infinity. For instance, if I look at stock prices, what's the lowest price you can have? Zero. You can't go below zero. What's the highest price? It can be any number. So there's a lower bound on price, but there isn't an upper bound. If I'm looking at profit margins for companies, the highest profit margin you can have is 100%. But what could your lower profit margin be? There's no bound. If your data is bounded on both sides, you might get away with just assuming symmetry. But if your data bound is only on one side, I gave you the example of stock prices being bounded at zero, you're almost definitely going to find stock prices having a positive skew. It's the bounding that creates a positive skew. Once in a while though, you will run into data that's unbounded, where you potentially could have minus infinity and plus infinity, though it very, 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 very rarely happens. At least you have the possibility of that happening. So boundedness can create skewness, especially if it's on one side. So let's close the loop here. You've got measures of centrality, the mean, the median, the mode. You have measures of dispersion, the range, the standard deviation, the coefficient of variation. You've got measures of skewness, which brings us to the final measure, which is measures of extreme values. When you look across your data, whether it's a hundred observations or a thousand observations, one of the things you will notice are outliers. And even with data that's normally distributed, you will get an outlier once in a while. But if you get outliers more frequently than you would expect to given the normality, then you have what are, what are called fat tail distributions. The number we use to measure the likelihood of outliers of extreme values is called the kurtosis. So a distribution with high kurtosis has fatter tails than a distribution with lower kurtosis. I know both variance and kurtosis are affected by extreme values, but they measure different phenomena. So you can have data that has high variance and low kurtosis, low variance and high kurtosis, or even high variance and high kurtosis. All three combinations are possible. Incidentally, um, if you, you know, one of the measures we use to judge the kurtosis, the likelihood of extreme values, is to compare to the normal distribution. If your distribution has more frequent occurrence of extreme value than the normal distribution, it's called leptocortic. If your distributions have less frequent occurrences of extreme values, it's referred to as platycortic. I know these are just buzzwords, but it's good to remember those. And even if you don't remember those, remember having extreme values can alter your results and should be factored in when you look at data. I hope you found the session useful, and I thank you very much for listening.